Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and our Start Woodworking series. This is the second class in the series, and I did end up breaking that class up into three parts. The first part, we just went over the basic set of tools that we're going to be using in this series. It's a very budget-friendly set of hand tools plus one power tool, the bandsaw. And the second, the entire second part of the series was dedicated to understanding the bandsaw. This third part is the actual lesson, so to speak. We're going to be learning the techniques to use two main tools. The biggest tool, most complex tool we have in our arsenal, the bandsaw, and the simplest tool, most elegant tool, a knife. And we're going to be doing an exercise making a spatula that will really drive home grain direction. So, come along as we start making a mess in the Star Woodworking Series, Class 2. First off, let's talk about some very real and not so real limitations of a bandsaw. Uh, real limitation. How much you can resaw, because it all depends upon how high you can get your guard up. Now granted, a 10 inch bandsaw is not going to be able to resaw a huge panel, but if you are the DIYer making workbench size stuff, you know, boxes, cat, small cabinets, that kind of stuff, you'll be able to make do with it. But I hear a lot of people not liking certain size bandsaws because they say, oh, well you can't cut I need to make a 12 inch board and this thing has less than 10 inches of clearance before it hits this. Well, let me clue you into something. This bandsaw might only have, you know, nine and a half inches of clearance before it's going to hit the post, but Well, you know, I think my making my point here. We got a lot of clearance on the other way. So if you have a wide board that you need to cut down, well, yeah, you might not be able to cut it down this direction, but that just means cut off the narrow side. And, you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there saying, well, I have a 24 inch board that I need to cut in half. Yeah, well, here's my response. What the hell are you doing cutting a 24 board inch board in half? You know how few trees grow to that side? You're going to waste cutting it down just by the smaller board. You don't need to have cut a bigger board. Don't waste it. There's also many times that, you know, we have a long stick or something like that. We have a 10 inch bandsaw. You know, you want to cut this in half, but obviously you can't cut it in half. Well, here's a trick. Come at an angle, cut it where you want, flip it back over, square it off. No big deal. If you just think outside the box, meaning outside your table, you'll be able to accomplish a lot of tasks with a smaller bandsaw. Now, with experience, you're going to find that most of the time when you're at the bandsaw, you're just doing freehand cuts. You're just you'll set the the guard down close to the board and then just start cutting. You won't use a fence or anything like that because you've learned tricks with your hands which I'm about to show you to to make those cuts. But the number one problem I see when people start out cutting on the bandsaw is what I like to refer to as staring at your front tire. You know when you were first starting to learn to ride a bicycle you know all of us stare down that front tire well, things happen really fast if you're staring at that front tire. Things move, thing, and you're just totally out of control. But once you learn to, hey, maybe stare up the trail a little bit so you can see things that are coming, because no matter what you do, that front tire is still going to be right there. Your hands are on the handlebars. It's not going to change the, the distance from you unless you snap the bicycle in half, which is kind of doubtful. So. Just look up ahead of the trail so you can see stuff that's coming and anticipate it. If you are staring right at that cutting edge, well, things are happening really, really fast. If instead you're looking farther back and kind of 
guiding the motion towards the blade, well, you have a lot more control because you can anticipate things that are coming up at you. So, when you're cutting on the bandsaw, when you first mar start making a cut, obviously you're ver verifying that the curve is going to be lining up next to the line as you want. But then your eye movement should be coming out in this area. Because what you're now doing is focusing on feeding into the blade. If you're staring right here, well then you end up making a bunch of corrections and overcorrect all the time. If you're looking right here and noticing through your peripheral vision where it is in reference to the line, things just slow down as you move through. Now, as you're cutting, here's your first safety lesson. If anything scary or bad happens, step back. This is one of the great things about the bandsaw. The force of the cutting action is going down into the blood, into the table. It's not coming back at you like on a table saw or any kind of rotating action. So, worst case scenario, step back. Turn it off and analyze the situation and what, how you want to progress from there. Now, I just finished up that straight line cut without using a fence. Did any of y'all notice how I did it using my hand as a fence? And that's what's so great about the tape, the bandsaw, is it is as close as I know to a hand tool as any power tool can get because it's your digits that seem to control everything. So. You have a straight line that you want to cut. Now obviously this is a rough cutting tool. So all you want to do is get it somewhat close and we will refine it with another tool. Well, a lot of times in this kind of situations, it's not that I'm going to get close to the line. It's just I want to kiss the line and leave it. You will hear us talking in wood turning, uh, split the line, leave the line, take the line. Many times in wood uh, on a bandsaw, I'm leaving the line because when I refine it, I'm going to take the line. Well, the easiest way I know to do that one is line it up with a bandsaw. I'll make some nicks, focusing on that cutting edge to make sure it's starting where I want. And then you will notice my finger. It will position itself outside of that black circle right here. And then my thumb right here will start moving the back of the machine back and forth until my alignment gets the way I want. And then I will just progress forward. Once I get towards the back of the blade, many times I will shift my thumb towards the back and then the other finger over here. So as long as you have two points, you have a ray. You can, you can move it straight fairly easily. And the little bit of resistance that the bandsaw blade gives you is a third point. So here we go. I want to I want to cut a straight line. I'm going to turn the vacuum on, turn the bandsaw on, and I want you to notice where I'm positioning my fingers and the fact that my entire hand is on the table saw as a brace. About that technique is it actually gives you more control it comes down to leverage I mean you can use leverage to either increase power or increase control or both at the same time well if I have a pivot point close to the blade whether it's in front or back well, all of a sudden this other action action is the leverage so I can do a minute movement in the back and it does a fractal movement up front or I can use it do a huge movement from the back and it will pivot the front a lot less. It's because you are farther away from the pivot point than the pivot point is from the cutting edge. Now, 
That's all great and dandy to have a fixed pivot point if you're cutting a parallel line. But how often do you do that one? Most of the time, you're kind of straightening up a curve or a random piece or something like that. So let's look at the same exact, exact example, except the line is not going to be parallel. The only thing that changed was my front pivot point just moved slightly. It controlled this distance to somewhat keep it in line in addition to this one controlling the angle. Now obviously the line I drew wasn't as straight, but the cut itself was straighter than the line. And don't forget, you still have another hand that's working off of that leverage action. As long as you're just not tossing the stuff through the machine, you have a very slow, controllable cut where everything is staying still except for what you want to move. The blade, it's not going to change its position. The table, it's not going to change position. All that you're moving is your hands and your fingers in a very controlled manner. One hand providing propulsion, the other hand providing direction. Gee, doesn't that sound like a handsaw? Now, when you want to start cutting curves, nothing really changes that much. You are still focusing not at the cutting edge once it gets established, but in this direction. Because the idea is you want to feed the teeth. And if you're staring at the teeth, well, then you can't control where the fork is going, so to speak. If you're staring right here or right there, you can kind of see, oh, I'm directing it into the teeth constantly. So it just it's much easier to control. And at this point, a lot of times with curves, my back hand will somewhat become the pivot point where I'm actually kind of moving it with the front hand and see how the back is just kind of guiding and directing it. Works out pretty well. Let's take a look. Now, while I'm making the cut, I want you to focus back here a little bit so that you can see what I'm talking about by you're kind of guiding it into the into the teeth. Yeah, I got off my line a little bit, but the distance, I just made sure to make it consistent so the cleanup would be a lot easier. If you start getting jagged stuff, that means you're not, you don't have smooth control. And that jagged stuff is what happens when you're focusing right at the teeth, because you end up just jerking the thing around. As you can see, the same is true when the curve is the other direction. But remember when we were talking in the last episode about how tight a curve you could turn based upon the size of the blade. And it had as much to do with the back of the blade as the front. Well, let's start cutting some curves. And this time I want you to notice the difference between the curve size that the blade is cutting and where the back of the blade touches and what the gap looks like on either side.
could really tell when I was getting it a little bit too tight because not only did the results come out jagged, but the blade itself started to twist in protest. But whenever I was focusing on touching the back of the blade to the side of the kerf, leaving that gap of the, the kerf itself in the middle, all of a sudden, not only did the cuts become smoother, but the curve itself became smoother and it was a lot more easy to cut. I wasn't fighting it. So a lot of times, you know, I said, watch the feed rate in the front, but you also kind of have to dance your eye to the back of the blade. You're somewhat ignoring the teeth, as strange as it sounds, because they're never going to change. What's changing is where the kerf is positioned as it's going, the invisible kerf of coming into the blade and the existing kerf coming out. But Sean, you said you hate changing blades, so how can you turn a tighter kerf, I mean a tighter curve, if you have a blade that's too wide for it? There's always a way. The problem we have is if you have the saw blade and you have the teeth coming out either direction, that sets a curve. So if you're turning a curve and you get it at the tightest point, it's leaving the curve here and touching the back of the blade. But this distance stays the same. So at this point, it's leaving the curve, but it's touching the middle of the blade here, coming out. So what would happen if we could eliminate it touching the middle of the blade? Couldn't we maybe turn a tighter corner? Utilizing relief cuts, you basically eliminate the contact wood has with the middle of the blade opposite of the curve from where it's contacting the back of the blade. So then you can just kind of pivot it in air and work it, work a tighter curve. Uh, a fun exercise to do is to just draw some curves on a board. We're going to start with some nice gentle curves and then get them tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And try to follow that line. What's gonna happen is once you see that the back of the blade is touching, you now have to straighten out the curves and thus creating relief cuts so you can go back in and clean them up. Let's try it on this curve.
So as you can see, the relief cut is your friend when you're cutting curves. And even with nice gradual curves, many times I will put relief cuts in there just because it allows me to move away a huge chunk of wood and it makes working it a lot easier. And that same technique can be used to create square cuts. How many times have you had a little square pocket you needed to cut out so another board would fit into it? I don't know, like dovetails or finger joints or something like that? Well, that kind of stuff can be easily done on the bandsaw. Just using your standard techniques for cutting the straight lines. a lot farther and make a narrower cut back of the blade and then simply clean it up you've ended up cutting a square with a tool design for cutting curves. Now you did just see me do something that was technically a no-no on the bandsaw in that I pulled out of the cut while it was running. Can you explain why you th that would be a no-no? Well, on the teeth side, there's nothing preventing it from moving the blade this way. On the back of the blade, we have that thrust bearing. On the two sides, we have the bearings or the blocks or anything like that but nothing's preventing it from pulling that back this way and coming off that wheel. So if you were to do a no-no like that, the key thing is you're watching the blade to make sure it doesn't move with you. And if you're coming straight out and you're paying attention that the back of the blade stays centered in the curve, it's a no-no, but it's not that dangerous. If you were pulling out of a curved cut, at that point in time, I would just turn the bandsaw off to get it get it out when you do that kind of stuff. But it also illustrates a point. You don't always feed into straight into the teeth. Sometimes you can come at them from the side. And you saw me do that one when I was starting some of the curves. You just might not have noticed it. For example, if I'm starting the curve in the middle of a board. In order to get it started smoothly, I'm actually going to touch it and I'm only going to be cutting on one side of the blade. And that's going to ease me into it until I'm cutting on both sides of the tech blade, uh, thus cutting with both set of the teeth. So when I do this, you might actually see me touch the back of the blade, using that as a pivot point to ease my way in until I, see, I hear or see a little bit of sawdust and then begin to progress it forward into the cut. And notice the entry is nice and smooth that way. You can even do that one if you need to cut a tight curve a little bit to make your cut. Okay, and now I want to smooth it up. I'll start on the side, and move the teeth sideways. Start on the side, and move the teeth sideways, nibbling it down. In effect, I'm coming across the teeth at just the right spot 
where it cut. Now that practice is actually frowned upon because what you're doing is you're actually dulling the side of the tooth so that whenever you want to start making straight cuts again, well one side is going to be duller than the other. And if you've ever had drag on the side of a boat or if you've run over a puddle with only one side of your car so that only that side's tires are going slower with more drag, well what happens? it tends to yaw or curve on you. So it becomes much harder to cut a straight line if these teeth, the teeth that are set to this side, are duller than the teeth set to that side. Also, there is a chance you can actually remove a little bit of the set one way or the other, which once again makes it harder for the blade to track absolutely straight. Now, so far we've been talking about using the bandsaw mainly on 2D items, you know, boards, sticks, plywood, that we can lay down flat on the bed and work that way. So now let's start adding a little height to it, adding some 3D factors. I'm a wood turner, and I would tell you, wood turners are the worst when it comes to bandsaw techniques. We will do some outrageous stuff with it. You will see us bending blades all over the place. That's why when me and my dad work together, because I also do flat work, it's like every time I step up to the bandsaw that we are sharing, I'm going to have to swap out the blade because as a wood turner, even I bend the teeth all over the place. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we work taller items. And those items are a lot less stable a lot of times because they're just straight from the tree. And that can induce some danger. For example, if you are cutting a bowl out and you come around here, well, do you notice that there's nothing underneath that blade right there? Well, if I was in that situation, what would happen is the tooth would grab and it would slam it down, pitch the thing over, and probably snap the blade. Now, this is an extreme example because obviously I use the blank this way, but even that is not stable. So you, as you're coming through the current cut, Many times you'll get to a point where something's above it and it'll start to shake and rattle and you're having to control that kind of stuff and that's where things can become hairy. It's also why I tend to run the blade a tad bit looser than a lot of people just to the point where the flutter goes away because it allows for a little bit more flex than if I had it bound, wound really, really tightly. But the, my main point is you never want to be cutting a part of the wood that isn't supported directly underneath it. The fact that I'm supported over here means nothing. It has to be supported underneath there. Now, having said that, some of my heroes are people like Sam Maloof that make those really nice sculpted rocker chairs. And when you first start watching them, a lot of times you will, they will seem to be doing this kind of action, just sticking a leg up in the air and carving it around. But if you look carefully, what they're actually doing is they've got it anchored on, on, on the bottom, on the, on the wood right here. And they have such force back here and they're taking a very light shaving off of a corner that they're kind of muscling it this direction. But in fact, it is supported right underneath the blade in line with the cutting action of where the other support is. Now, I would not recommend this. Also, if they were to do it cutting it this way, well, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter how much support they have here and here. The fact that this angle, this support angle from here back to here is not in line with the cutting edge, that's going to want to kick on them. But this, notice the cutting edge is a lot closer to where it's being supported so that they can get, if they can hold it back here, they can get some leverage on it. Now that is a very advanced technique and I obviously would not recommend you even trying that until you get a lot more experience involved if you're doing like big chairs and stuff like that. But today we are going to be making a little spatula. And I'm choosing a spatula because it's got some curves in it 
and uh, but it's mainly straight, unlike a something like a, a spoon or something like that. Now, if you want to, you can make something very similar, maybe a back scratcher or you know a paper, uh, an envelope knife or something like that. But the concept is going to be the same. Now, in the theme that we are using mainly big box store materials, I purchased a one by three poplar board from one of the big box stores. Now this kind of material is priced a lot different than other stuff in the lumber yards. Uh, it's sold by the foot, linear foot, not the board foot or not the board. You go up there and it is priced at 99 cents a foot. So I went and cut off three feet at that little manual saw section that they have in the stores and took it up to the counter. They scanned the little sticker, shows 99 cents, then they enter in how many feet you bought. So this board right here cost me $3. And so I could, in fact, may probably make three or four, five spatulas out of this board, which isn't a bad value. But I wanna first cut it down. So obviously my spatula is gonna be a little bit longer than this distance right here, or it could not be. I just want to show you this trick in, in life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it through at an angle so it fits in front, cut an angle, and then square it up to the length I want. So grab your stick and then just, you know, sketch you out a spatula. Or at least the head of the spatula at first, not the full thing. Now, like everything, grain direction is everything. And you want your handle to be as strong as it possibly can be. So the handle itself must follow grain lines. So what I would do is I would pick one grain line and follow it down. That right there is just a sapwood and stuff like that, but the grain line itself that I follow down, that one started there and ended here, looking at it. So, I need to somewhat draw my handle so that it encompasses the way that grain is moving as best I can. And we want to do the same thing on this side. Notice that the grain starts here. And if I follow that grain line around, it's ending up over here. So that's a pretty steep slope. And I always like my spatulas to be at a little angle. So if I want them to follow the grain as much as possible, the weak point is going to be this section right here, the transition. So that's where I want the grain to be in line. So my thinking is I want a slight curve coming this way to the tip that narrows out so I can scramble my eggs and then the rest of the handle being very in line with the spoon. So my drawing is trying to follow the grain as best I can. Grain flowing up through the handle. The only part that the grain's kind of coming off of it is in the spatula, but that's also going to be the widest part, so that'll give it the best chance of strength. So, let's use our new band saw skills to cut this shape out. So, we have set our blade tension, we have set its tracking on the wheels, we have lowered our guard down so that we have a little bit of clearance so that we can see our edge. We're going to be using our hands to provide propulsion and bracing it 
and directions. We are going to use both the front of the saw and the back of the saw. And we will even be pulling on it. Not everything has to be pushing through. You can also pull through the back. So, right now, let's go ahead and cut out one side. Now I'm going to have, grab some blue tape and tape it back together as best I can. Transfer any lines that I covered up. Raise the guard up so that it will clear. And I can see the tooth entering. And now we're going to resaw off the shape that I want to get. The main important part, I want to remove material off the, the blade up into the handle in this back section right there. It will be less for us to remove later on. But I'm going to do it a little bit different. A lot of times when you're resawing, you're pushing into the blade and because things are so narrow, you're actually pushing towards the blade. Where everything else you've seen me do, I've always been kind of pushing past on the side. So if my hand slipped, I'm going this way, I'm going this way, this way. I'm never really going into the blade. So I don't like that aspect of this cut we're going to be doing here. But I have something I can grab hold of on back. So this time, I'm going to make it safer on myself and move to the back and pull my way through. I'm still going to be using the fulcrum point and the levers. This hand's going to be providing propulsion, this hand direction, but it's going to be behind the blade. So I, there's no chance for me to push into the blade. I'm pulling my way through.
And there we go. A bunch of scraps and a rough spatula. Remember, the bandsaw is a rough cutting tool for me. This is not the final shape. It's just a rough outline. And this is the same when you're processing wood for boxes or anything like that. Eventually, if I have another tool, that's probably a blade that's going to touch it. So let's now talk about the Sloyd knife. This particular Sloyd knife is made by Mora. And once again, it's one of those unicorns in the industry right now. An extreme value out there that a lot of experts says rivals some of the best of the handmade stuff out there. I think they are $20, $22. I'll put a link in the description to them. I, I don't get paid for recommending this kind of stuff. Now, again, to the uninitiated, all it is is a blade with a little wooden handle. Doesn't look too complex, but a lot of times complexity hides itself in simplicity. I mean, look at my pocket knife, my General Buck 110. You know, the blade has all these angles on it. It folds and stuff like that. This is so much less useful a knife in woodworking than this one. And a lot of it comes down to slope. Yeah, we are heading back to high school. You basically have rise over run. Run, rise. If you have a given point up the rise area, and you have a line that is a certain distance, it is going to return one angle. But if somehow you can increase the distance traveled, but not increase the rise, you're going to have a much lower angle over there. Distance travels decreases the angle of ascent. Now, all you that ski have actually felt this sensation. Okay, so you have your mountain, you have your skier, and for most of us, we will ski across the mountain, and then you'll make a turn, go heading down the mountain, you'll speed up really quickly, and then you turn back to go across to slow down. Speed up, slow down. Speed up, slow down. And the speed is dictated by your body reacting with the slope and gravity. Now, if you are a psychotic uh, paper boy and you have a customer that hasn't paid the bill and you're trying to catch up to them in a ski town, obviously you head straight down the mountain because that will get you the fastest speed and you'll be able to catch up with your deadbeat skier. Well, that idea of being able to change the angle of a slope when the angle is actually fixed simply by increasing the distance you travel is a very common tactic in woodworking. I mean, you have a hand plane right here. The bevel, the blade attacks the base at 45 degrees. So if I were to push this plane straight across a board, the wood shavings, the blade is actually interacting with the fibers at 45 degrees. But I want you to think about this. What would happen if I skewed the blade? and then moved it across. Well, now the wood is coming up across the blade, across the mountain, thus lowering the angle of attack. So the blade itself, even though it is bedded at 45 degrees, is interacting with the fibers at a much lower angle. Well, one of the hallmarks of a Sloyd knife is the fact that the bevel of the blade is so long the edge is right here, and it extends all the way out. So that can give you an extremely low angle. Whereas most of us are more used to something like this, po my pocket knife right here. Where, yes, that looks like the bevel, but it actually isn't. The bevel starts right there and goes to the edge. Probably a millimeter. Because it's much easier to sharpen a blade if you're just taking off a little bit of metal. And if any of y'all have seen, you know, those kitchen people, they'll take a steel and then they'll sit there and they'll sharpen both sides. Well, they're not sticking the blade like this. They're canting it over to the side to engage that little micro bevel on edge. Now, that does a couple of things. It makes this edge very robust because if you think about it, from if you ride that bevel out, 
it's actually extending way out over the sides. Okay, so the angle itself is fairly steep, which makes it robust. This one is not very robust because it is so narrow. There's very little metal on that edge. Now they remember me going back and saying that this looks simple, but a lot of times simplicity hides the engineering that goes into something. Can y'all see, let's see if I can zoom, that's as high as I can zoom in. Can y'all see this little line that runs across about right there? Can y'all see that? This blade is actually a laminate. You have a very hard steel that grinds away slowly right there and a fairly soft steel for two thirds of the way. So whenever you're sharpening this particular blade, you've got to remove the metal from here to here in order to uh, take away any nick. So it becomes incredibly important to ride it flat on the stones, not rock it up for any other random angle so that you can get that long slope that gets you that low angle. But because it's only hard here, you can put a little bit more pressure on the edge and then this back section just kind of takes care of itself. It's kind of a sharpening feel that you have that still enables you to remove a lot of metal quickly, but maintain a very hard, low angle, sharp edge. Having that long, flat bevel also affects the use and the results you get from the blade. One of the reasons why pocket knives make such horrible whittling knives is that micro bevel you have on the end because this thing will not cut if you just lay the back of the bevel and the blade down because you have the micro bevel that's kind of kicked up a little bit so it's not actually engaging the wood in order to engage the blade you actually have to lift the back of it up so now you're riding on two points that are very close together and it's just hard to control it and get a smooth even cut whereas if you have a nice wide bevel well I can ride the back of that bevel on the wood and then get a nice smooth controlled cut all the way through that has nice smooth lines it's not bouncing up and down if you have a short bevel it's like a Miata it's got a short wheelbase so it's very darty jerky it's great for a sports car where you want quick turns and stuff like that but if you compare that to something like a Cadillac or a limousine with a very long wheelbase that has slow reactions, well, everything seems to happen a lot smoother to that. And for the most part, when you're carving, you want those nice smooth corners. Yes, you can make it turn tighter corners by lifting up off of that bevel, but it gives you that option. If you have the short wheelbase, you never really have the option of the nice smooth lines unless you're a highly skilled driver now let's go back and examine those blades again if you look at this blade it doesn't have a single straight line on it you have a gradual curve that increases as you get towards the end and notice that the bevel itself decreases as you get towards the end so once again if you wanted to turn that tight corner you use a tip where the bevel is a lot shorter. You come back to the end, the bevel gets even longer and you gain that stability. Whereas your, you know, your typical pocket knife, yes, it has a general curve towards the end, but the majority of it is straight. And that difference between a slight curve, which is much harder to sharpen and shape than one that's fairly straight and then just kind of tapers off towards the end, affects the quality of cut you're getting and the ease of use of making both curves and straight lines. That's one area I don't really know how to explain it in an analogy. It's a sensation when you're using it that that slight curve just enhances the feel where you can actually tell when you have a very straight edge when you're uh, working it. It just doesn't have the right feel. I don't, I, I just don't know how to explain it any better than that. And feel is another reason why the handle works so well. 
you know, a pocket knife like this that we assume, you have to hold it. This design, it looks simple, but it just kind of fits your palm. If you're spending all day carving it, you would be surprised at how little you squeeze the knife. A lot of times, it's just fitting in one part of your palm. You bring your pinky around there, and it just kind of wedges in there. So it's a very loose hand making a controlled cut with the blade. The shape, it's, it's one of those personal things. You see pro carvers out there, they, they have little things uh, all over the place, little undulations to fit their fingers for different grips. But the overall shape is generally a very tapered short handle so that they can get it. So as far as techniques, the first thing I want to talk to you about is safety. Obviously, just don't put flesh in front of the cutting portion of your blade and you're pretty much going to be fine. But woodworking and this type of woodworking, working with knives, is somewhat of a social gathering. I know a lot of people, uh, they'll meet up at clubs, you know, everybody will grab a piece of wood, grab their knives or something like that, and make something during the presentation or something like that. Keeps your hands busy or stuff like that. How many movies have you seen the uh, grandpa out on the front porch whittling away? It's, a, it's just a nice, relaxing at, uh, aspect of the craft. But because it's social, a lot of times you're passing tools from one person to the other. And there is a specific way you need to pass a knife. It is not like this, okay? It is not blade first. Generally what you do is you have the sharp end up front, you lay that in the web of your hand, and pass the handle over. That way the person recipient can grab the safe part of the blade and hopefully they have enough experience to lift it out of your hand. But if they don't and they actually pull it out, well, that's the dull part and they can drag it out. And the worst that happens is you will get a scratch if they drag the tip really harshly. I've never had that happen. But if they just drag it out by accident, you won't get hurt and neither will they. So when you pass a knife to somebody, pass it handle first, sharp edge up away from you and them. So grab yourself one of those off cuts we did whenever we cut out the, the spatula or whatever item you are creating to practice on. And we're gonna practice a few cuts. Now all the cuts have some kind of safety element to them so that there's no way you're putting a body part in front of your uh, of the sharp edge, which is why you typically do not carve in between your legs because you can, if something gets loose, your leg, either one is in the way. Most of the time, if you're doing a power stroke, you're actually carving off toward the side. And there are a couple of power strokes I mean, meaning cuts that you're going to use a, a lot of, uh, Cuts that are going to take a lot of material away. So I've got the sharp edge of my blade kind of laid in my hand right at the crease of my fingers. And if I, you want to, you can brace the knife along your leg and then you're actually going to straighten your arm and pull the wood towards you. So the knife isn't the part that's moving. And if you get the grain direction just right throughout this always pay attention to the grain direction you can make nice long shavings also if you can't the blade up you can start at the heel and work your way all the way across the blade so you're not doing one section more than the other and just take nice long shavings but because now it's skewed you will notice there's a lot less resistance try it one way, hold it at 90 degrees, make the cut. The other way, let it cant in your hand, just kind of resting there, how much easier it is to get through. Also, notice the surface finish. Smooth. The other technique you can use in that kind of same position is if you hold the blade either in that 90 degrees or the slack handle, and then lock the wood to your leg. Now, Notice I'm starting right at my leg, so any movement is down and away. And then just drop your shoulder. So you're using your entire upper body 
not arm strength to make the cut. Those are two really powerful cuts you can use to eliminate a lot of material when you want to. Did you notice both of those cuts, you didn't have to have a lot of hand or arm strength? It was using leverage in the big muscles of your body? Well, there's a lot of those kinds of techniques if you want to study, you know, sloid carving and stuff like that. One of them uses leverage, where if you put your knuckles together, notice how you can move the knife with leverage. So the back of the hand is providing all the muscle and you're pivoting off your knuckles. So if you put the knife, a uh, piece of wood in one hand and connect it real close to the to the end of the knife, the end of the knife, well, you can get a lot of leverage rotating around your hand. And as you do it, the whole idea is you want to use the entire length of the blade when you're making cuts. So you're actually planing it. You can take off little bits or more bits. Another technique I use a lot also uses that kind of fulcrum aspect, except instead of it being your knuckles, it's your thumb. I'll place the thumb at the back of the shank, and then by using my wrist, most of the power is being pushed on the bottom, so you can see the leverage action. So right around the thumb, the blade isn't moving, but the handle is moving a lot, so I can get a lot of leverage, and if you need to make smooth cuts over a wide section, there you go. And the idea is to use the entire blade and you can make a smooth area that way. Another technique is to actually come back towards your body. But notice, if I'm right here, it is very hard for me to press into my body. It's in my wrist. You, you kind of have to do that action, which is unnatural. So I can come over here and use this hand, the rear hand, to move the move the knife see see how that's working and you can make nice smooth cuts and there's no way you can cut your hand because it's not angled towards your hand I'm not cutting into the, my thumb I'm cutting around it same you can push with the thumb instead of using it as a fulcrum so, go ahead and grab the spatula, maybe turn something on the radio or something like that, and just relax. Take it. I want to thin this out. Well, I knew that that wide shot would do that one, so here we go. Just work it around. Play around. The key things you're going to want to watch, though, is grain direction. Obviously, if I start cutting this way, I'm cutting against the grain. I, if I'm cutting in that section, I obviously want to cut down with the grain and transition over. You're going to find that in the bends and stuff like that. One direction, you might be going with the grain and then it's going to catch. So you're going to have to take the knife and go the other direction. My suggestion would, to be, would be to get one face all smooth shaped you want, flip it over, do the other side all smooth, shaped how you want, then square it up, and then go back through and start adding bevels and such like that. Always taking care where the blade is, where your power is, and if you can skew it or come in straight. And feel it around. Play with the knife until you get the spatula just the way you want.
and the last thing when you get the shape somewhat like you like it a lot of times or if you're like me then this is just kind of a fun little exercise we're not really concerned with the final product as long as it's useful and just any paint stirrer will be useful as a spatula but right before you're done if you want to you can use your knife as a scraper just to get those last little bits because i'll tell you this part right here is where i had the hardest time because there's a transition in grain that's always in in uh in uh, spoons i make so sometimes i would just scrape that center section to get that last little bit of tear out and just not worry about it the reason why you do it at the end is because it will dull your knife but when you do this don't go just in one direction all the time kind of start one way and then the next time do it the next way and next way because if you do it all one way you'll get these undulations by angling the blade every now and then over it you kind of go over those and you don't get that wavy pattern and it just kind of gets the last little bit of those fibers. You can sometimes scrape the bevels too. If there are any sharp edges. But pretty much guaranteed you're going to have to sharpen your knife right after that. And in the end, don't be afraid of getting a little bit of sandpaper to do it. We aren't pros. There's no shame. Well, there's my finished product. It's not perfect. You know, I got little knife marks here and there, but all I'm really concerned with is getting a smooth edge up front so I can scrape the bottom of my pan whenever I make scrambled eggs. Other than that, it's okay. A little sandpaper to smooth out that right there. I'm fine with it. So the last very step is add finish. And just walnut oil you can buy in the salad dressing area of your grocery store is a perfectly fine natural finish for something like this. Finish will highlight all your knife marks. Oops, I missed, had a little knife mark right there, but who cares? This is a great learning experience because it forces you to think of wood in a 3D manner. You have to understand grain direction. All those little tear outs and stuff like that, no big deal. This was about a 30-35 minute project for me. I turned on some classic rock and just zoned out for a little bit, refining it ever so much each stroke. Well, there you go. The end of class two and you walk away with a little souvenir. Or I hope, I hope you will go out in the shop and at least try this exercise you know this is a good 30 maybe 40 minutes of work no big deal put on some classic rock classical music or country music or whatever and just zone out and relax you're using your bandsaw to get most of the brute force work done and then using a slightly more elegant tool to just take away a little of the time all that doesn't belong this was a great exercise in understanding grain direction because it was no longer a 2D aspect. I'm sure you realize that the grain would reverse on you all over the place and you never quite really knew where it was going to go until you felt it with a knife, which tells you machines don't feel stuff. So if you're just blasting, uh, blasting fiber through wood, they have to have something to accommodate the lack of feel, the lack of touch. I kind of like that idea that the machine just can't do as good as we can because we have a tactile relationship with the material we're working. So please, if you got some value out of this or you think that somebody else might in the future, please look down in the description below. I have a couple links where you can help us out and kind of subsidize our efforts to make this kind of educational resource for future generations. And in the end, remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.